So uh, I'm Josh Stolz. I figured we'd do an attack seek workflow overview. Um, the first half here, I put in a PowerPoint because I realized uh, just in terms of the CPU runtime, no matter how small I made the objects, um, it wasn't realistic to get this within a talk. So um, the first half here is just aligning the reads and that's in a PowerPoint. Um, and after that, hopefully we can do something that's more live demo. In this case, we're looking at attack seek data, but really it's a very similar process for all chromatin digestion data. And for those who don't know what attack seek is, is it's active transposon available chromatin. And what that does is gives us an idea of the accessibility of the DNA in chromatin. Um, it does this by digesting what's called linkage DNA here in between nucleosomes. This right here on the DNA is considered to be protected DNA. And so it will be less digested. And the whole, the whole game of chromatin data is peaks and valleys, right? And so when you, when you align your reads, you're looking for peaks at where uh, the, the nucleosomes are and valleys where they aren't. And so what we're going to get here, if we can see here, this is going to be a small fragment. And when we go to align that, there's really going to be like hundreds of pieces of DNA here. And so you're going to get a peak here and not much here because it didn't digest. What's, what's blue and red here, these are primers. So when you go to amplify, um, this isn't going to get amplified necessarily as much as this will. And so in your out batch, you're going to have uh, the cut pieces of DNA that are prepared to be amplified. And then you can, um, you can ask questions like, uh, about regulatory response, you know, uh, mostly it's around uh, transcriptional start sites. And this tells us how, how upregulated or downregulated a gene might be. And so, like I said, this is all about peaks and valleys. And what people like to do is to throw it in to IGV. And you'll see, um, you'll see kind of here what we would interpret it as, and we can't raw interpret this just from eyeballing it, but this would be a nucleosome, this might be a nucleosome, this might be a nucleosome, this might be a nucleosome. And what this is, this is the, the depth, the depth of coverage here by, uh, by just mapping the reads back. And so what I thought I'd walk through is to get us from a raw fast Q file of paired end reads back to um, a big wig that we could load into IGV and search our favorite gene if we like. And that should tell us, you know, that could give us a, a better overview of chromatin data. So the two data sets we're working with today are, I should post these in Slack in case people want them. They, they are from an EBV transformed um, lymphoblastoid cell line. Let me stop share for a second so I can get the slide. And uh, they're attack seek data. Um, And they're two FASTQ files. And so the first thing we have to do is we have to remove the adapters. The adapters are, if we look back here, so we look back here when you, it's almost like a primer, right? 
when you map these back, you're going to get a read length. And that's an important part of your data. And so having these annealed on that add an extra 20 to your base pair length actually puts you at a position where you've skewed your data too long. So your first step in QC is to remove the adapters. Here I am using uh, R SAM tools because I try to do everything in R. Uh, you can do this very, very easily with just regular SAM tools. Um, and what we're doing is with, they're looking for a common, this function here, identify adapters, is just looking for a common, oh, dang. Is there a way you can have a, like a pencil? Oh, well, I'll just use my mouse, um, but. Gosh, you can annotate with Zoom, but it gets a little tricky when you're the one controlling it. I'm not sure if you can do slides, but I know that Zoom has an annotation feature. Cool, thanks, Louise. Um, so here, identify adapters. What that's doing is looking for a common nucleotide sequence at the beginning of each read. And then that's just identified to be removed here and these read one trimmed fast Q outputs. Oh, geez. Now I gotta figure out how to clear. Okay. And then the next step is to align and sort your reads. And again, I did this in bow tie. Uh, and um, so this is our bow tie in, in an R environment. You can, you can run this very easily um, from the command line. Uh, and it'll probably be faster. But here you just need a, you need a reference panel. Oh my gosh. And bow tie to build um, essentially is just gonna take your two fast cues and move them into a SAM file um, down here. This is building a reference or an index file for your reference. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is, this is building an index file for your reference. And then down here, we have our, where we're building our SAM file. And again, I think this could be done faster at the command line, but it, it's kind of nice to keep your scripts intact. A key here is that with chromatin data, you always want to do dovetail. Um, are, is anybody familiar with what dovetail means? Okay, so if you have your paired ends, they can't do this. This is not dovetail. This is dovetail. Um, so they can't overlap uh, in terms of where they map to. That's usually a bad sign, but it's there's not really a reason we would expect that to happen in, um, in chromatin data. And so we just drop all of those that aren't separate. Okay, then it was running too slow. So I did the next two steps at the command line. Um, I just took SAM tools and fix mate checks for any errors and stuff. And then just convert your, your SAM file to a BAM. And then I sorted it and sorting takes forever. Um, you can choose how many threads here and how much memory to assign to each thread. I would recommend more because this took like three or four hours. Um, so we're back into to an R environment here and we're using subread and we can check our, our mapping quality with pr prop mapped and P mapped here. And we could see that we got a pretty, a pretty good mapping score. Well, like 99%, 99.1. 
And so uh, we can keep moving. Um, and then with the same same package here, our subread, we can use read G alignment pairs to subset our BAM for just chromosome 21. And we picked a couple columns here we want. So Q name, map Q, and I size. I size is the length of the read. And we set a long ranges one to 6,302,500 or 63,025,520. And I, uh, so that's, that's really nice because I would use this function because it's a pain to subset um, these BAM files and, and they're usually huge and really slow. So it's nice to have a subset when you just want to look at a specific region, uh, which in this case, we want to look at chromosome 20. Okay, so I thought we could do the rest live, hopefully. Hopefully, give it a try. All right, so we've got our attack reads here. And what we're trying to do is get the read length off of these reads. And this is the important part of why you have to do it with paired end. You cannot do this with single end reads because you need the first, the difference between the first and the last pair to tell you how long it is. And we'll talk about why length is so important in a second here. So this is getting the first read, but really what we're trying to do is just get the first column and get I size, which is, uh, they call it insert size in this package but it's really fragment size. It's really read length. And so you can see here, we have just a list of read length. That's the length of our entire library for chromosome 20. And now we can make some plots about distribution and histograms. So we wanna look at fragment length, right? We, we wouldn't expect a random distribution of fragments. We expect them to be at the length of nucleosomes. And so here we can make our fragment length plot using just a little, a little GG plot I made. Um, that it just, it's just a distribution of the fragment length. All right, let's take a look. Okay. How do I zoom out here? I guess it's fine like that. Um, so what we see is that we have a spike. You can almost think of this like a histogram, right? So we have a spike here at about, I'd say 50. Then another spike at about 180. And then kind of the 180, 200, we'll call it peak. And then again at like 360, 400. Does anybody want to guess, like, like give a biological explanation as to what's happening here?
So if we go back to our first picture here, and we look, um, if we look at this first one, most of what is going to be cut is here and here. Or it could possibly cut all the way to here and here. The length of DNA on a nucleosome is 145 base pairs. And so we would expect a peak at a little longer than 145. And I think that's what we see. We see here we have a peak around 180. Uh, what do you think the second peak is? Anybody, any guesses on the second peak? It's, it's it kind like, of, it's kind of, go ahead. Is it like a chunk of two? Like, yes, yes. It's, it's when one gets cut here, but instead it cuts the other one here instead of there. So when you do a digestion, especially if you don't digest it very long, you get chunks of two instead of one. And uh, if we widened our x-axis, we would actually see that there's probably a very blurry third one out here um, reflecting a trinucleosome. I didn't have this in the figure, but this is a very important part of a tax seek, as this smaller first peak represents transcription factor binding. Um, they don't really come in a specific size like a nucleosome does, but you can pretty well assume anything less than like 80 base pairs is representative of transcription factor binding. And we can confirm that more later. That, that's a pretty broad guess. Um, but yeah, this, this, if you were checking attack seek data and trying to QC, this looks good. Typically, you'd want this curve to be more here, but as a whole, you're still getting the trend and pattern. And so what we can do is then we can take in our we can take a log scale of this just to get a better look at it. Um, and so this here, this isn't, this is counts now um on a log scale and so you get a better idea of just kind of how our reads are distributed uh keep in mind right we we trimmed these so you're not gonna get as many reads near zero because we actually we we've trimmed them um but as a whole this is just showing the same graph as last time but in log scale Then what we can do, just for a nice, as you can add, I just added here kind of bins to kind of signify everything down here, transcription factor mononucleosome and a dinucleosome in this range. And these bins become important later because we're going to separate the BAM file by sizes. All right, so next we're, um, we're going to library a I guess this is like a, a transcript 
a genome annotation type thing. Um, I don't fully know, but I know you can get all the transcriptional start sites out of this package. And that's what we need. This is a specific package, uh, SOGGI, that specifically looks at um, like peak detection algorithms in, in nucleosome data. And so we'll run one of these. These take a really long time and I have the rest loaded in the environment so we can just plot them. Let's try. So this first one is actually almost like a negative test. So we're looking for regions where there is an absence of a peak, where there's less reads than we would expect. At sizes um, zero to 100. And so we're actually looking for transcription factor binding is effectively what we're doing. And that'll make more sense when I show you the graph. Does anybody have any questions so far? I'm going to kill it. This takes like 10 minutes. Give me a command line here. Don't kill me, man. But I. Uh, this was probably, that was probably a mistake to try to kill this. But anyways, um, we are oh, shoot. I'll give that a minute. I have these saved. So it works. We could just close it out and reload. But what what the plot is gonna show is basically they're gonna align almost every promoter region and give you like a distribution of average reads in that range. Um, I like this package because, I mean, this usually takes a very long time and is very hard to do. And it was easy to set up these graphs. Um, it's not the most aesthetically pleasing. Like uh, I've seen better visualization than, than what they give us. While that is waiting, I guess we could look at look at the region plot function.
So you insert a BAM file, some test ranges. In our case, we have TSS as our test ranges, which is if we look at TSS, oh geez, I guess we can't. But it's uh, it's just uh, the the transcriptional start site. So it's like a start and stop of every transcriptional start site. Um, and then our sample name, what else do we have here? Style point. And really the key here is your window or your max fragment length. Um, because that's going to classify what you're actually looking at, right? Are you looking at mononucleosomes, dinucleosomes? We could really name this transcription factor. Okay. This isn't working at the second. I can pull up where I got the pictures from and maybe we could see them. So you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so this is, a, I'll, I'll link this as well. This is kind of a workshop I based this workflow off of. Um, but this is what it would have looked like. Where, and if we could imagine here, this would be good to draw on. So this would be like our promoter region, right? the gene going this way. That's a bad arrow. But so what we can now kind of begin to assign biological meaning to is that these reads that are less than, oh, that's because I called the function wrong. That's why you have to plot it like this. But uh, this, uh, this shows us that the, the transcription factors or the reads of a certain size align to a certain functional region of the genome. And so now that that's enough to begin to say, okay, these are probably transcription factors because they're only binding to the promoter here. All right, so then for the mononucleosome one, we can look at, and our uh, same thing here, same genes, but uh, we start to see a depletion. And to be, to be honest, this isn't a very good separation for nucleosome data, but it's still there. And this is kind of a pattern we see in biology. Um, where it's called, it's called hedging, or some people call it encroaching, where you have transcription factor bound at the promoter, and then a nucleosome here, and then a nucleosome right next to it. And so the reason you basically get the middle of this peak is deleted is because there, the transcription factor is binding here. So a nucleosome can't occupy that space. So you get a removal 
or a reduction at this point in the histogram or in the frequency plot at where you would think there might be more here. Um, and even more so, th this actually looks pretty good for, for the dinucleosome plot. We, we start to see kind of a divergence as well. Um, so let's see the next portion of the script. See, that's actually how you want it to look. And it, it's also that the scale for this isn't very good uh, because the promoter is only really, it's only really here. And so you don't need this extra on the x-axis, but you would like to see what that indicates is you got a really good digestion. When you see just the nucleosome separate out, when they're kind of overlapped like this, um, that tells you that there's a lot of, of linker DNA left on the nucleosomes when they were digested. And it's, it's just going to be fuzzier data. That's, that's basically kind of the gist of it. The other thing this tells you, I guess I forgot to say this, right? What could you assume, I guess, about a gene where, let's say this were, I don't know, Where's, where's the pencil here? All right, let's just say this, this was BNF. What could you assume maybe about this gene given this graph? Because this is kind of the whole takeaway of why anyone at Weeper would ever care about my nucleosomes. Um, so we could say it's poised, right? We could say, in this case, at this gene, there is a transcription factor bound. So this is likely being expressed, and this is likely upregulated in whatever tissue you studied. On the other hand, uh, something like this, you, there's, and there's studies on this with like machine learning and linear models. The wider these two gaps are of the nucleosomes is directly proportional to the amount of expression. And so in a case like this, I would say maybe this gene, this promoter is closed off at the moment. Right, there's not really a gap here where something could bind, where a, a transcription factor could get in there. But when they're separate, you can see that they're open. Um, there's a lot of good papers on this uh, where you, because of this pattern, you can really use a lot of machine learning and, and linear modeling to show how would you say a, a relationship between expression and and a tax seek and not as much has been done with this I, I think it's because of the type of data it is right it's not it's not count data and it's not um it's not you know like like genotyping it's you you have to kind of look at peaks and that makes it more difficult to to analyze but I think the other thing is, right, out of this, you can get, the, this is more than exploratory. This is mechanistic. Let's say we had a gene hit, and again, going back to this gene, and we know our transcription factor isn't bound. Well, now we know why it's not expressing. We don't, ju we don't just have a hit, we have a biological insight into why that is actually happening beyond just um, a statistical significance. I guess the downside is it's really expensive, right? Like it's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not cheap and it's hard to develop bulk data of this. But um, that would be 
the upside. So the last part here, I said we would end with a wig file. So if you don't know what a wig file is, it's just the depth across the genome. It's just a file that contains the depth at each position across the genome. And then you can plot it and it's like a, like a mile long histogram of your, your data. And what this, uh, what this will tell you is, is it gives you just a visual kind of you can spot check. And it probably something a biologist could do more with at this point, um, because then you can go into IGV and you can look up a gene and say, what's your favorite gene? And look at whether a transcription factor is bound or not. But this is a step that's important. Uh, basically everything we've done so far has come to here. So we've chosen our numbers to separate our band file by 100, 180, 240, 315, 437. Uh, for the dinucleosome, got our mononucleosome, and then everything down here we're going to call transcription factors. And our So then we can write out smaller BAM files. I've already done this. And each of those BAM files we can take with this function here. Uh, let me see if I can get it up on the console. Open region bigwig. Oh, that's the name. Why don't you guys yell at me? That's the name of the variable, man. I'm losing my mind. But uh, <laughs> anyways, we're just taking the taking the coverage out of uh, out of our BAM files, and and basically putting that into a big wig file. And uh. And then um, we're taking the ranges off of those reads. And so you'll have a pair, right? At this position, you have this depth. At this position, you have this depth. And that's what a big wig is. And so that's what we've created. Um, and I think I had planned for kind of our last portion to show you how to put something in IGV. And so I haven't really messed around with this too much on a Mac. I usually do this at work. And we'll see how IGV does on a Mac. All right, how do I clear this guy off here? And we'll look at the open regions one, just as an example. If we have more time, I would I would load it in all together to show you why you have to separate by size, but you you can't you just can't see anything. It would just take forever to load.
And we only did chromosome 20. Aha. So, and then you can get, you can get annotations down here so we can look at a specific gene. Usually you can highlight. And we're zooming in on this gene specifically. And we can start to see that are that you can kind of interpret the, the chromatin pattern here. Now this is the smallest one, right? So we would have, we would be looking for a transcription factor. Oh, dang. So this is actually running, running this way, which is counterintuitive. But if we, if we look, we do have a peak here. It's a little further down than I would expect. Um, but that could be like a mapping issue that you worry about. Uh, so this could be the transcription factor, um, but this could also be the transcription factor associated with link 15097 here. And so this is kind of kind of it's almost anecdotal. If you were if you were studying one gene, this would kind of be a really valuable analysis to go through and kind of spot check the chromatin organization at each gene level. I think that's all I had planned for today. <laughs>